and hello and welcome to the first Elf Room podcast in two months, I think, perhaps. With me, Frank Shortle, and the man who helped Maradona win the quarterfinals against England in 1986. It's Ian Hand of God. Thank you. Thank I kind you, of expected Frank. a clap after that or something for some reason. And in 1992, Ireland won the Eurovision with a song called Why Me? By Linda Martin, and we're joined here by her illegitimate son, Shane Martin. <laughs> so, if that was, but I was born in '89. Was I Ill- illegitimate? Uh, uh, it was Shane? during her time with Chips. Oh, Grant. Yeah, she was on the road a lot with Chips. <laughs> that so, makes sense. Uh, obviously, that... they they swung by Cork. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about Maradona and Linda Martin as much as I'd love to spend an hour talking about Maradona and Linda Martin. I That's don't next think week. there's enough to, to, to <laughs> fill an hour. We are here to talk about. Well, let's let's rewind. Our very first podcast was called Let It Be The Future. Our classic album that week brought to you by Mr. Ian Hand was Let It Be because it had turned 50 years old into 2020. But now, fast forward to the future and there's a brilliant three-part Disney series that was released just last week and we're so excited about it that we thought, fuck it, we'll come back and do a podcast Literally just about us. So if you don't like the Beatles, switch off now because all you haters out there give out to us about (laughs) just talking about the Beatles. We are literally just going to talk about the Beatles. (laughs) Um, So yeah, it was directed or put together, compiled by the brilliant Peter Jackson, um, who obviously did all the Lord of the Rings stuff and the World War One documentary he did maybe, how long ago was that, three years ago? Something like that. So yeah, if there's any man to take on 50 plus hours of footage, it's Peter Jackson. And um, I personally think he did a fucking unbelievable job because it's just over eight hours in total. And it's (laughs) where to fucking begin with it. Like it's it completely flips on its head what we all thought happened in that time period. It confirms lots of things, but it completely flips on our head, like lots of our perception and notions of how the Beatles ended or how those sessions went. And it's basically the first kind of like exposure to like reality television, nearly. Uh, like it's very, very first like kind of examples of like candid camera. And yeah, the fact that it's been hidden from us for 50 years is just madness. So. I think to begin, I'm literally just going to ask each of you what you took away from. We're going to start at the end and work backwards and we'll pick up topics um, along the way. But my overall impression was that kind of what I thought about that period is now completely altered because I was only hearing it from like books written by biographers, interviews with people who were biased, interviews by people who didn't remember it properly. And just the mythology, because it's so rolled in with the end of the Beatles that it's always just been the negative stuff that we found. So when you see them being happy and you see the dynamic of the band in person, which you just never, ever see from any other time period in the band. um, That, yeah, I've just been still haven't fully processed exactly how much of the Beatles we saw. And like I genuinely like miss them afterwards. I kind of felt like I was like knew them after it, even though I've read about them nonstop for basically the last 25 years of my life. um, This is definitely the closest I have ever gotten to them as a fan. And it's just it's utterly bizarre. So like start with yourself, Ian, what like what did you take away from it? Yeah, um, it really did feel like that. So just before I go into it, um, it really did feel like we got to know them you know, actually know them, like their personalities, the dynamics, everything. Because I think the original Let It Be film, you know, Michael Lindsay Hogg, you know, it it was very narrow in terms of scope, you know, and what Michael wanted to portray, you know, it was a very specific narrative. Um, And just an awful lot of the band dynamism got lost completely, you know, and one thing that I think a lot of people would have taken away from the original film, and again, Frank, what you were saying, the uh, perceptions of Let It Be and how that period ended, you know, the Beatles and that, you know, 
was it was very much Paul and you know directed completely by Paul and it was Paul's struggle to get it over the line and get it done and it was his project you know but I think a major thing I took away from this was um, I think first of all uh, just roll back a bit in the Michael Lindsay Hogg film the original one it really does portray John very much just completely aloof you know uh like you see an awful lot of the footage from Twickenham uh, in the original one. Uh, and this this is when a lot of them were uncomfortable with the cameras, you know, in the early days of uh, that January. But w- w- with this expanded three part, you know, uh, nearly eight or eight or nine hours, um, you get to see much more, you know, outside of Twickenham. It, only, only, it was only a few days Twickenham, really. You know, they spent an awful lot in the studio getting ready for, you know, obviously the album and then the, the rooftop performance. But... What re- a real impact for me was that how you saw that it, it you know it first started off maybe kind of being slightly you know produced by Paul at the start and him kind of dragging it along, but certainly at the start of part two you really see John come into his own, you know and really sta- you know standing up there and you know, having a say and say listen Paul, you know it's not just, it's basically not just you you know like it, it is us as well and you know. Um, obviously sticks up for his own part in it and, and, and George as well, uh, and Ringo for that matter. But yeah, really for me, I think just to summarize, sorry, <laughs> I'm rambling a bit, was that uh, it very much showed the entire band effort of the whole project, you know, and not just Paul's project per se, you know, like it showed how they were all involved, especially from part two on, you know, I, I really liked that. You know, it, it basically showed what it was actually like, you know. Yeah, just the actual truth of it. Yeah, which like just to clarify before I uh, turn that on you, Shane. Um, that original film that came out, did that win? That won an Oscar, no? No, it it, it won a Grammy. The soundtrack won a Grammy and stuff. It was a Grammy, yes. Um, but yeah, that like original movie that came out in nineteen seventy by uh, Lindsay Hogg. It's terrible. Like it really is. Like I've I've always like watched it and stuff because I watched it trying to get from it what I got from the Get Back series. Trying to get this like Jesus, look at this candid footage of the the Beatles in a studio, which we don't have any footage of. Um, but like it's so badly edited. It's so badly. It doesn't tell the story at all. And it's like I don't understand why because. There is so much footage, and that's what's great about the three episodes, is it genuinely tells a story. They have so much, like, there's no gaps in it. There's no, like, oh, the cameras weren't turned on, so we kind of missed that little bit, or uh, George left, but we didn't really get that on camera, so we'll just have to say it. It literally has fucking everything in there. So I don't really know what he was at with that movie in the 70s. You know, like, he's still, um, sorry, just just before uh, with Shane, um, He's still very deluded, Michael Lindsay Hogg on it. Mm. You know, like, like I read an article recently in in the Rolling Stone uh, about his reaction essentially to Peter Jackson's three part uh, series, and he's he's still very confident that Let It Be, the original film, holds up. You know, it shows a lot of love and warmth. <laughs> it absolutely doesn't, and uh, he's confident that it will get an official release fairly soon. <laughs> like it's just... Why would you ever want to watch that now? I know. <laughs> It brings nothing to the table when this is out there. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, before we discuss more about that, Shane, what was your final thoughts on it? I I totally agree what. <clears throat> sorry, I totally agree with what you're saying as well so far. But uh, and and like I've talked to you about this a lot before that I kind of have a slight obsession with um, learning out learning about how people put songs together. And that's what I really loved about this is watching a song like for people who don't write music or or have never been in a band, they really get a really cool insight into like the chaos of creating something that like the, I love that they're coming up with lyrics and asking each other, do you've got a better line than that? And and analyzing each lyric and trying to change it and stuff. And like just putting the songs together, playing it over and over again and trying to find it, trying to get it up on its feet. So 
that's one of, was was my biggest takeaway from it was like it was an absolute brilliant look into that and how how things got developed um to touch on something that you said earlier frank it is masterfully put together by peter jackson how it flows together which i'm not surprised by because he took one book the hobbit and turned it into three movies so <laughs> somehow he he has no problem you know getting a lot of footage and <laughs> making sense of it but um yeah it's 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 just a really like i found myself in parts like as you were saying really getting to know the beatles like laughing with the like it's like you're when a joke is cracked you're like oh ringo <laughs> you know what i mean like you're part of the crowd almost you get sucked into it so um yeah it's just i i can't really put into words how entertaining it was like it yeah it's over eight hours what absolutely flies by when you're watching it you don't even notice the time passage of time because you're so enthralled in it and it's so um just intriguing to see how it's all put together. So yeah, I just really enjoyed that kind of side of it, of being let in the door of the studio and actually seeing it come together. There was yeah, come together. <laughs> <laughs> there was parts of it where I was like, like I literally didn't like, like look at my phone. If I was looking at my phone, I'd pause it. Or if I was going to the toilet, I'd pause mm. it. If I was picking picking up another biscuit i'd pause it you know I, I wanted to make sure i wasn't missing any of it but there was parts of it where i was like sitting there glued to it and i was thinking i was like if you're not a beatles fan this must actually be torture like this is <laughs> if this was any other band this would be like if someone showed me a documentary like about i don't know uh michael jackson like that maybe i i wouldn't be bothered really like it's it really is just the Beatles that garners that interest for me and possibly the world because they are such a big thing but yeah if that same documentary was that same style documentary was made for lots of other bands like the Eagles or something I'd be like god this is treacherous they're just doing this song again and it's just like <laughs> well but I that, said, um, it wasn't long enough for me you know no mm. absolutely but th that Guardian article that came out after part one uh, was aired. It's My genius. God, your man, your man was not a fan. <laughs> that's yeah, that's the thing. I, I I read a small bit of that, and I was like, yeah, too right. I like cause there's a few people I've spoken to. I was like, oh, I, I watched the Beatles thing. They're like, yeah, I may download it. And I was kind of thinking, I think I don't think you're gonna like it. <laughs> I think you're expecting like a, an anthology type kind of flashy, yeah. makes sense. There's bits in between. Yeah. There's snippets of interviews. It's not. It's literally nonstop. Like there's parts where there's nothing going on, but it's where just, they're just messing and yeah. just kind of yeah, yeah. yeah they're <laughs> just it's, they're just shouting and making noise and no. There seems to be fucking no direction going on isn't anywhere. That, uh, isn't that very familiar, lads? Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. As a band, as a band, yeah. 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 I think any band can definitely. Uh, so I think what's nice as well, actually, if you're in a band, you can be like, well, geez, even the Beatles were fucking messers Completely. doing nothing a lot of the time. Completely, and even seeing um, that's a brilliant point. Like even uh the way they actually approach songs, like sometimes like, oh my God, that's how we, you know, like, like that's how we would do it. Yeah, or, it's reassuring you know, that they weren't untouchable. Like, yeah, yeah. That it wasn't yeah. just they brought in these amazing songs and they immediately sound great because it kind of feels that way sometimes when you're listening to Beatles albums, you're like, fucking hell, yeah. leave something for the rest of us. <laughs> um, but yeah, there was parts where the songs sounded terrible and they're just like, how did this actually end up being such a good song guess it's just like it's going nowhere <laughs> yeah but that's the thing is when they're that it's repeating the song over and over and over again and as you're saying to somebody outside of that they wouldn't get it but like i was like oh he made a tiny it's the incremental changes that take it from nothing to something is really cool mm. yeah i was gonna bring it up later but i suppose now is the best time the beatles as musicians as always kind of being like uh once again, there's stuff that gets lost in where the mouth and, you know, people just saying it so often it becomes true. You know, Paul was the the classical musician almost, you know, the, the just the unbelievably good, can put his hands on anything and he's just a structured, really good musician who's just short of 
being a classical musician in terms of writing music basically um george was a great guitar player john was mainly a rhythm guitar player and wasn't flashy at all you know john's never remembered for his guitar playing and ringo was just there playing drums but like they're so good one one thing i noticed especially from the rooftop gig ringo never counts them in no that is phenomenal they just it? start george counts them in in a few of them yeah that's kind what i of. noticed george going one two three four and but, looking at ringo but yeah rarely like especially there's a part in the rooftop i think where they do um don't let me down which has to kind of all start at once in that initial kind of you know first beat and they don't even look at each other they just start i was like what the fuck is going on here that's that's like that's telepathy that's it's like phenomenal familiarity with each other yeah and then just like when you look at arduous recording processes that we've been involved in and stuff that, that like click tracks and stuff you're just like jesus christ this is just like like i think what's amazing is when it comes up on the lr writing saying this is the one that appears on the album and you're like holy shit <sighs> I've yeah. been listening to that the whole time thinking this was like, you know, the most thought out kind of, well, oh, yeah. maybe not with Let, uh, let It Be, sure, but like. Um, for me, that, that that in particular, where you just said there, uh, Long and Winding Road, that mm-hmm. was literally just here, just, just, we'll get this one, you know. Yeah. And and John, John literally just kind of got the bass down the way yeah. Paul kind of wanted. And then they just start recording and that's it. Now, I know it's not their first take, but it's a very early, quite rough take of it, and it's it's fucking flawless, you know. Yeah, that's it. Just to go back to them being musicians, there, um, like there's, they are so good. Like in terms of, obviously, there there is better musicians. There is like um, better bands, um, musically, but they were so good at um, just playing, like immediately knowing what to do yeah. like just even when they're just messing around with like covers and stuff you never ever see one of them sitting idle going oh what, what what are they doing they like literally glance over at each other and they're able to play it and like granted now some of the stuff they're messing around with is just 12 hour blues or it's just country or it's just waltz or it's something very simple that's just you know a well-practiced musician knows the the lengths of phrases and stuff in certain styles but when they're doing their own songs um and they just kind of join in and stuff you're like fucking hell how how have you just immediately got how long that phrase is or how many times he's gonna sing that you know you've you've heard it maybe twice where it's literally just like oh i've got a song Hmm. and then they're like immediately kind of doing it and just yeah it's Lennon especially I was blown away by John Lennon's musicianship I kind of knew it about the other lads um but yeah John Lennon was a much much better guitar player and just all-around musician like he's fucking as he keeps saying himself he was on fire on that lap steel um <laughs> yeah, yeah I was gonna say that's uh, one of my favorite bits was when he was like uh I've peaked I don't think we should do another take because yeah. I've, I've peaked on that last I th- take I think it was yeah <laughs> Paul or George says it was like Glenn what did that sound like and John yeah. was like well I was on fire there so. yeah. <laughs> it's brilliant yeah I, I think as well just when you're on about John and his musicianship um I I I personally think the bass he laid down for let it be is fantastic can we just talk about that before we talk about anything? Can we just talk about that baritone guitar? So cool. Because we've Unreal. never, if we've always just seen a bit of it in like compilation stuff for like. And the odd image. Yeah, yeah, the odd image and video. But we really get to see it. Mm. And, and there's the class records as well. Well, that's it. Well, it's, well, there's parts when they're jamming and John is doing like full chords. I think it was. He's playing it and dig it, isn't he? Yeah. And yeah. it's like this weird bassy sound and the part where he's messing with the whammy bar and playing the really high strings that's really because i've always wondered that about baritones it's like how bassy are they because it sounds like once you don't see it being played in front of you it's just the bass it sounds exactly yeah. like paul's bass yeah and yeah, even as a small small little parts where glenn john says something can you take a bit of top off that or a bit of low and then that and you see them actually fiddling with the amps and you're just like fuck this 
I don't just see people recording with like these baffles and barriers and stuff. I was like, <laughs> this was <laughs> no, literally. That's why I love Glenn Johns to this day when he talks. He's just like, you just put microphones up and record. That's all you do. Mm. Yeah. It sounds bad if you have a shit band. <laughs> sounds great if you put the microphones up and tweak them till they sound good. Yeah, there's no rules. There's no right or wrong way. A big myth that was actually dispelled for me, anyway, um, with the the footage was, um, you know, uh, t- you know, uh, two of us mm-hmm. song uh, that for for a long time there was a lot of articles out there saying that George played the baritone guitar on it. Yeah, he didn't. No, the, 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 it didn't feature on it. He played the telly, wasn't it? Yeah. Mm. You know, like that was great. Like I just, yes, you know, that, that shut them all yeah. up. There know? just is no bass on that, yeah. No, but yeah. because it's quite bassy, I guess, the tones he's playing, you yeah. know, like, yeah. I mean, it's a very nerdy little, like, uh, oh, he just wasn't using it. <laughs> I don't know, there's loads of parts in it where it's like, I've, I've always wondered who isn't on, like, how many songs Lennon didn't play on, say, the White Album. Because I say there's a few on that. Yeah where it's either a john or a george song like piggies does like does john do anything on piggies or savoy truffle probably not that you're always like well ringo has to play drums on it unless it's paul doing it on like back of the ussr or something um and then it's like well it's probably paul playing bass on most things so you'd be like oh if john has a song it's like they come in and do the rhythm section but then once it's a paul song did john does piss off or not turn up that day but uh yeah i wondered that with a lot of the some of the songs on that, I was like, he was just as enthusiastic. Like he was, he was still as invested. Like I was expecting a lot more moments where Paul's playing a song and he's just like putting the guitar down or not putting much of an effort in. I never knew he played the solo on get back. That was was actually news to me. (laughs) But this, but that's exactly it though with John Frank that, um, the original let it be Michael Lindsay Hogg's one led you believe like, you know, he let that led you to no interest that, in it. Yeah, that he was just so removed from it, despondent. You know, yeah, he was just there along for the ride type thing. You know, but no, he was a real active role in it. Like, you know, well, I think if you want, if you want to get then into the politics of the whole thing and how it changed my understanding of it from everything I've read, it was always that all four of them had gone onto their own things, which is evident in it obviously you know they have only a month to record because Ringo's gone off and doing his movie uh, The Magical Christian yep and um, George is into his Harry Krishna stuff Paul is into holding the band together but making them more you know back to being a live band and John's into his bagism and Yoko Ono and his solo stuff but you can tell as well that like John from his own accounts and in interviews in the 70s is given off this impression that he was like, yeah, fuck this. And I said that and I was very, you know, angry about it and all this. Like he was a very, you know, cutting character. But when you watch it, you tell that he has just as much doubt about letting this go as well. Oh, completely. Like he's not he's yeah. not sitting there going, I can't wait for this to end. How do I get out of this? You can tell that he's like, I want to go my own direction, but I'm also shit scared of losing this band. But sure, you hear at one stage he suggests doing it for another month, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. isn't he, he? He keeps on saying when they're suggesting the rooftop, he's like, I want to get up on stage. You know, I want to play, yeah. Yeah. you know. But even George says to him <clears throat> um, that he has all these songs and he could give them to other people too. Uh, he's like, I've got my quota of songs for this band for the next 10 years mm. and I could give them to other people. And he's saying it to John, he's like, but, you know, fuck that. You know, I could just put out my own album and then come back and still do the Beatles. And John is encouraging. Him. He's like, yeah, do it, man. Like, do your own album. I'd love to hear what that sounds like, you know. I keep on saying, you know, because that's what they say <laughs> after every single sentence as well in the documentary, you know. Um, but like it, 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 it is evident that they are trying to keep together, but they're also wanting to do different things, which is which could have been OK, but it went the, the other way. Well, you well, you touched on there, Shane's very interesting with George, I think, for, from what I picked up in it anyway. Um, you know, I think 
a lot of it there, and you see it, it's plain as day and let it be like that. Yeah, or not certain let it be. Uh, uh, the get back sessions, you know, I like think we George can just make has, them interchangeable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like George has so much to give in terms of songs. Like songs are nearly absolutely ready to go. You know, just put a bit of drums and bass on them. Like, um, but you see it. Now, yeah, I suppose it's more evident in Twickenham before he leaves, and partly the reason why. But even in the latter days, you know, when he comes back, like into uh, the studio in Savile Row, and that, like he has all these amazing songs he'll jam out with them. And like he jams with John and that for one stage, but they're just never really, uh, you know, like the rest of the lads never really go, Oh, well let's, let's have that down on the album. Let's take it on as Beatles songs. I think George very much felt like his songs are maybe being cast aside. And that was George in that conversation with John. He was kind of like, maybe I should just go and record them myself and you can- preserve the Beatles thing in terms of, mm. I'm not being allowed to bring much to the table here. Once you know? again, though, you can understand Paul, like Paul especially was a businessman and he understood that the Beatles brand was the two boys writing songs. Mm. That's where they got famous. It was Lennon McCartney. So he was constantly trying to get back to that. Like he was constantly being like, this, this is the Beatles thing. It's what people know and love and it's our brand. So obviously, George bringing all these songs in was kind of, yeah, but it's, it's it's not the, it's not the, that's not the ingredients. You know, that's too much George for the recipe of the Beatles. Yeah. Um. So I don't think he was being like, oh, fuck you, George. I think he was very being like, we need to no. preserve this brand. Yeah, but I think George just kind of resigned then. Oh, yeah, obviously. Like, well, you know. Yeah. That George was trying to but break a, out of just being yeah. the happy-go-lucky guitar player who got the song yeah. every so often. Yeah. There's a good moment as well, though, where they, I think they've done, I've got a feeling a million times and um, <clears throat> they're like, will we do any more? And uh, John does go, let's do one of George's. I, I've wanted to do one of George's all day. You know what I mean? And I think they start working Harris on songs. Harris songs. I love that <laughs> phrase, the, the Harris songs. But um, is it they do something? Um, they do a bit of something and he's, he's still struggling with the lyric. Uh, yeah, attracts which me I, like a cauliflower which, <laughs> and he keeps on saying oh, it like, granite. <laughs> like a moth to a candle is what he had there and mm-hmm. uh, like while you're watching it you feel like screaming like no other lover just <laughs> when's he going to say it <laughs> you know <laughs> um, but uh, what I wanted to ask you actually just now this occurred to me is like uh, what was your favourite moment in it in, in the, the, the series if you could pick, if you had to pick one, um, well, I have my. Uh, if you give me a few seconds to get my notes, <laughs> um, I have my favorite quotes. Um, okay, well, I can I can instantly guess one anyway. So, uh, talk amongst yourselves, there. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, <laughs> I just I, I think for me it's not so much just one moment. I think for me, the big one was certainly a part two, I think, when John really stepped up and became a real voice for himself and the rest and the other two, you know what I mean? That he kind of brought it back to a a, a band project and not just this original, this initial vision by Paul, which of course it is. I'm not taking away from Paul with that, you know, but... Like like John, John calls Paul out himself actually, and that's one that that there you go. That's one of my favorite moments actually. That, 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 there you go, Shane. Right. So it's when <laughs> it's when John actually calls Paul out. He's like, "What's because John because Paul's you know he's he's going around in circles at one point, like giving out about something or the structure, and John goes, "Yeah, but like you know what you don't like." And I'm paraphrasing here because I don't know quote for, quote for quote, but he says what. You know what you don't like is that this was initially essentially your your project now it's turned into a band thing, and you don't like that. And Paul is like, well, yeah. you know, they're, like they're sitting know, at the piano. They're sitting yeah. at the piano, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, do you think that came from off the back of the conversation that was recorded in the cafe that did the the secret microphone in the plant when when Paul is like, you know, you're the boss. 
this has always been your band. And he's like, well, sometimes I'm the boss and sometimes you're the boss. I think him saying that was no, him was, trying to get sympathy almost. Of course you know, it like, was. Oh, yeah. Of course. Uh, I'm always I really nothing. loved that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, damsel in distress. But there was it, it was both of them. There was both of them Which, trying to work each other to convince to, to convince the other one to go convince George to come back. I think what's it, fascinating about the whole you know, thing is if you want to take it on just their personal relationships, you'll go. Oh, George is getting angry because he wasn't getting his songs. Paul yeah. wanted to manage the band since Epstein had died. He wanted to give them a work ethic and a structure which he says in it you know it's a it's a day-to-day work structure that's what we should be doing yeah in a very passive aggressive way but he's sitting there and then john and is casting like aside poor george martin as well at one stage terrible. yeah yeah i'm talking to john here yeah uh, terrible and then yeah that jo- john is like let's just record an album let's get rid of this theatrical shit and you know the basically selling a brand trying to copy other people the stones and um but the other underlining thing, I think, is the fact that Paul is trying to manage them since Brian Epstein had died. And then I think the other boys aren't willing to get on board at what he's doing, not because they artistically and creatively don't like it. It's because they kind of felt like they're in limbo before meeting Alan Klein and they wanted to wait to see what direction they were going to go in before they committed to doing any of these things. So I think that's why they were being very awkward and quiet when Paul was pushing these ideas because they were like, yeah, let's, we're kind of doing something else behind your back here and we want to figure that out before we burst on with these kind of silly things that we're not creatively fully behind. So I think that's another underlying thing. It's not as black and white as... Of course not. ...artistic differences. Yeah. And you know, Paul, in the end, he was right about Alan Klein. <laughs> well, anyway, that's, what I, that's my favourite moment, I think. Glyn John saying that he thought Alan Klein was a dickhead. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. And John trying to stick up for him. He's like, yeah, but he gets things done. And John yeah. Glyn's like, as someone who has no skin in the game just going I think he's an arsehole yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he I, says it in a nice way he's like yeah. he's very uh, he's an strange odd man. Yeah. he's an odd man yeah. and then he goes well maybe he doesn't talk to you the way he t- talks to me because you're yeah, you yeah. you have more but, worth basically yeah. yeah yeah but the way he talks to me is if he doesn't like your answer he changes the subject yeah he's like, like halfway through your answer he'll just start telling you his <laughs> yeah 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 I love Glenn Johns he's my favourite character in the whole thing oh he that, was fantastic. that's actually this is one thing I have written down here to talk about is uh, changing my opinions on things because the legend always has it is and then the band got Glenn Johns in because they didn't want George Martin because they wanted to change something and George Martin was pushed aside so I always would have thought oh fuck that must have been awkward because Glenn Johns must have been like coming in being like I'm the young book I'm the cool rock and roller that's made all these Stones albums and Led Zeppelin and well they probably hadn't done Zeppelin yet but um, I'm the new young trendy guy and i'm pushing out this old fogey so it must have been really awkward george either wasn't there or he was a spare tit in the corner but what the footage shows is that two of them got on like a house on fire they were actually they were kind of a bit awkward of who was in charge or whatever but you can tell that the two of them did really get on they could see them agreeing on like positions of things and how to figure out this fucking mess they were in completely and that's what i loved about because in my head i was like the two of them must hate each other to this day they must be a bit weird about it but no the two of them were like the adults being like let the kids figure their shit out and we'll just make it sound great (laughs) yeah that's what i like i love the two of them working together it was great and people forget that he actually did some co-engineering stuff on abbey road so he was there for like i'd say george martin took a bit of a shine to him because he was like glenn's the only thing that is holding this together i'd say george probably maybe doubted him but when he saw him in action he was like this lad knows what he's at yeah like glenn was in behind working the desk and getting the sound and i felt like george was in the room like getting the boys to get together and do some music or, or encouraging oh that that piece of music like coming in with the lyrics or the song sheet this is a songs that you've worked on so I felt like George was in the room and Glenn was out and just took care of getting the sound right you know which I thought was really cool it, it was collaborative it wasn't them working against each other 
No, that's like what I w- would have always thought it was. Mm. Like, was George Martin being like, oh, this should be more professional, and Glenn being a bit more like, nah, this is rock and roll, man, we just stick a mic up. That yeah, was yeah. what it was in my head before seeing this, but it was. It was really these two professionals working together. Mm. Well, you know, it, it was both down to George Martin and uh, and Glenn Johns to get them out of Twickenham and into a proper studio. And the two of them completely, you know, customized that studio to suit them, you know, and like George, the whole way through it, George Martin in particular, like he's at their every beck and call, you know, uh, like anything that he can assist with musically, like he will and yeah. getting things right. It's just um, what I love as well. They're kind of the ones always like, does there have to be this city show? Like, can we just concentrate and getting good sounds yeah. and good songs? And mm. like, I think they're the ones really seeing the how realistic it would be like if they're to go play a show we have to transport all this gear we have to properly get it to set like i think the beatles weren't understanding that like and the, the movie people weren't understanding that like because i love that bit where it said it's now too late to book a venue it's like oh, fuck it, of course you need to book this ages in advance like yeah. it's like <laughs> no one else could see that like do you want to bring us through some of your quotes there frank so yes yeah, so some of my favorite quotes from it or um one from john lennon here which is uh i'm not getting on that kit without a ciggy <laughs> that was the one i predicted <laughs> <laughs> uh i'm gonna see if you can guess who said this one I'll, I'll, I'll no i won't i'll do it i won't do an impression uh it woke me up from my sleep and i don't like it ringo uh, no, it's the, oh, the old Londoner one on the street. Yeah, oh, Londoner yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, then one from Ringo here. It's a short and sweet. Uh, I've farted. Yeah. <laughs> George, George Martin sitting beside him. Yeah. yeah. No, I think uh, this, this is the idea. I did not ever think that that happened. That Ringo would just turn around really relaxed while Paul is making a very serious point about the gig and just turn around to the most sophisticated man on earth and go, I farted. <laughs> just thought I'd let you know like, but um, I have one more have one oh sorry go ahead I'll no, do this one on. in the style of well it's the Beatles isn't it it's that's a, uh, every Londoner on the ground yeah every Londoner on it did you notice the did you notice the Irish woman yeah she was short yeah. and sweet she uh, he said you know who it is yeah of course it's the Beatles and who would be your favourite Beatles Ringo yeah, <laughs> I was like, "Oh, she's Irish." <laughs> um, Frank, can I press you for a moment? I think it's the yeah, Glyn Johns one. one. Uh, yeah, talking about Alan Klein, just any Glyn Johns one, because yeah. like I always, obviously, I love him and his son, Ethan Johns. They've between the two of them, they've basically produced Bar, Mister Eric Clapton. Many of my favorite albums. Um, <laughs> I'd say it killed you to hear George praise Eric Clapton like that. Ah, uh, he was young. That's <laughs> before he got off with his wife. So, and John corrects him and says, "Yeah, well, that's Eric Clapton. You're George Harrison. Like you're fucking George Harrison. <laughs> yeah, you're better than that dickhead. But I'll yeah. still take him to Toronto with me because yeah. there was no one else." <laughs> Jimmy Page has started his new band so I'll take Clapton <laughs> uh, yeah I'm happy they didn't get him in I think actually let's before we finish the musicianship side of thing Billy Preston what a fucking yeah, musician well, Jesus Christ I, I was going to bring that up next because I, well can I talk about my moment and then we can go into Billy Preston Okay, yeah. Sorry, I thought you had said. Sorry. sorry. No, no. <laughs> I was we stuck. Can... I was cut in a moment there. Sean. We can cut that. And we... I was cut in my own I, moment. I was going to say mine and then we can go into Billy Preston then. Um, so my favorite uh, of the whole thing um, was Ringo showing George Octopus's Garden on the piano and the how supportive George was and came over and started playing guitar with him and and showing that these chords resolve each other much better if you play it this way and then you get back to the start and and Ringo then going oh yeah and they start working on it and yeah John comes in 
and they're like, we're working on this song. He gets behind the kit before uh, Paul gets in there with his strong left arm ruins and it. Um, ruins it. Ruins the whole thing. <laughs> but um, but what comes I love about it gives that, out to gives out to John for bringing his wife in, and he brings his fucking whole extended family in. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but what I loved about that is they they like Ringo's getting a nose in and George is lo- leaps to his side straight away to because he knows what it's like and starts helping him. And then John gets in and he's working on it. But what I love is when Paul arrives, uh, they're working on it and John goes, it's a really strong one. He just says that like, it's a really strong one to, to Paul as if to say like, we should work on this. Like, let's not throw this one away. So that was my favorite, just like Ringo getting, getting his uh, five minutes. Yeah, jo- well, George continued to help Ringo. He has songwriting credits on Photograph and some yeah, of his uh, solo right. stuff. So George has a uh, George and Ringo are probably the best friends. Yeah, I'd say so. And uh, throughout it, um, yeah, I always kind of questioned John and George's relationship because in my head I was like, oh, they must be best mates, but they had quite a strained relationship forever because John mm-hmm. has constantly thought of him as his his minor kind yeah. of uh, understudy. But yeah, it was nice to see them kind of getting along for most of it yeah, there's a really good moment with them when uh, Paul goes off for a meeting there's like a lunchtime meeting and uh, it's just uh, the three of them then jamming away it's um, funny yeah it's they're continuing to work on Paul's song yeah uh, yeah. yeah I, I like that but yeah. the, John, hearing John singing it was yeah he's cool. really he's really not good at singing it that's what I, I was like <laughs> no not at all usually at all. I'd be like Lennon should sing all the songs because his voice is just so good but when he starts singing I got a feeling I was like oh that's that's one that's just for McCartney yeah yeah but sorry Ian yeah you were saying no no but that, that that's it that you know oh. you, you, well I said it there like <laughs> oh sorry <laughs> that, you were that, saying that, more it, no, that it was when when Paul went, you could see the relationship. You know, like you know, you know. Jeez, that fucking fell flat in its face there. <laughs> Sorry. Jesus Christ! Can I give a a bit of a, a background to Michael Lindsay Hogg? Oh yes. God, go on. Um, no, this is there's nothing. This is just a quite interesting bit. Um, so yeah, he he is an American guy who's from quite a, a well-to-do background and uh in the movie world and then when he he moved to london and he in 1965 started working on ready steady go which was like a early top of the pop soul gray whistle test sort of music thing you know, like all those early videos of the beatles and the stones surrounded by people that's remember that they, that's what got him is his big land like yeah um well perhaps not for the for this gig but um yeah and then he went on to do which i didn't know all this he went on to he did paperback writer video he did the hey jude video he did the rain video and he did the revolution video so obviously that was him already working with the beatles but he also conceived and did the rolling stones rock and roll circus and did the editing then on in 96 when it got properly released but that's i imagine why paul originally wanted to bring him in like that i think this whole thing was based around that rock and roll circus in that paul wanted more avenues for them to be getting out there because they weren't playing gigs and he wanted them to play live and wanted to have this tv special and stuff like that but yeah that's who he is and also he thought he was orson welles son really (laughs) That it actually made sense for a very long time that he was Orson Welles' son because his mother was, oh shit, I can't remember her first name, something Fitzgerald anyway, and was in that world and hung around with Orson Welles. And I think she even thought that Orson Welles was his dad. Jesus. But then some biographer, some biographer worked it out that it wouldn't make any sense because she actually moved to Ireland a month after he would have been conceived or something she would have technically been in ireland when he would have been conceived so it wouldn't have matched up but there you go that's mr Lindsay hogg there the piece of shit that brought us endless endless hours of footage <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about billy preston and how amazing a musician he is um because i always thought that they asked him to join but it's clear in the documentary that he was just dropping by to say hello 
or, or am I getting that wrong? That he dropped by to say hello and they're like, oh, we're working on a few numbers. Do you want to sit in? I think perhaps George might have been in contact with him. It was George. With him. It was told, George. Him, told him to drop by and maybe jam a bit. Okay. Yeah. That they might need extra keys on things. But I loved, once again, just being in a band and seeing that kind of, still that awkwardness of like, oh, we've, you know, maybe a few songs, if you yeah. know, like, whereas that is their really awkward way of like, please do this. Yeah. <laughs> as as soon as he joins in, and at this point you've heard them rehearsing different songs for Twickenham, or in Twickenham, and now they're in Apple, and as soon as he starts playing on the songs, you immediately go, oh, well, there it is. That was the missing ingredient. It sounds well, yeah. so good. You, you see Paul, you see Paul's reaction straight away. You know, it's fantastic. It's right there on camera. You know, it's just brilliant. Shit, um, good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Yeah. But it gets them all excited about the songs that they maybe have been like just playing into the ground. Now they're all like, oh, we can hear it now. This is going to be great. Did you just notice as well? Like they get so much tighter as well when Billy's there. Mm. Oh, <laughs> you know? It's like but, we have to be in our best behavior. Lads. Well, that's once again, like, you know, it's you have to be. It's even like if you're just sitting in a, a bar with all your friends. Uh, and someone who's not as close comes in and starts talking you know you're a bit less loose you're more you know <laughs> structured with your conversation and stuff like that so it's that sort of thing of just like geez we better get a shit together here because there's someone else who doesn't get our shenanigans the way paul talked about it in the anthology was um that they were like a family and families fight um but when a guest comes around to your house you're on your best behavior and you don't you put on your happy smiley faces for the guest you know and that's what he thought billy was there good for you know i loved when um paul uh, at one stage he turns around to billy and he goes sir like, do you mind coming in every day yeah. you know yeah. and, and billy like no it's great it's yeah. good <laughs> paul's like, like oh you're I, sorry you're, if you're probably just wondering like you're not even getting paid for this <laughs> yeah yeah the, the getting paid thing i was like <laughs> they start talking what, what about contracts you know? and yeah. but also that he says like uh Billy's goes, no, I've got nothing else on. Yeah. <laughs> like, Even though he's on TV the next day, which is great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're talking about him quite early in Twickenham, where to talk about touring with yeah. Ray Charles and stuff like George that. George so. and that, yeah. Um, they do. But then they talk about somebody else for getting in for keyboards. And they're like, we could get a such and such, a type. But they do mention Billy. And I think for me, that's where George was like, great, I'll get onto him. I think he probably knew he was in London. Yeah. I think that's why he was dropping in him in general was because he well, knew he was going to be swinging by like the new from Hamburg originally wasn't it yeah, yeah yeah he was in the the club circuit in Hamburg yeah. um my favorite moment with Billy was when they're jamming on uh uh I want you she's so heavy it's class isn't it and he's like he's like, he like he jumps away from the keyboard like starts clapping he's like this is fucking so cool but what I, <laughs> what I also find funny about it is he doesn't quite understand the vibe that John has gone for John yeah. like because that scale is so different the like that is very different where Billy was like keeping a very traditional gospel blues Whereas like John was like kept trying, he kept repeating it to kind of get Billy to play it on the keys the way he <laughs> wanted it. That kind of darker, more yeah, kind of seedier kind of sound that is on it. But he actually plays on it. Um, Abbey Road, the first song on Abbey Road that they started recording was in February, uh, February twenty second. Only literally a few weeks after the get back sessions ended, and they got Billy to play keyboards on. Uh, I want you and something and that was his contribution to Abbey Road so uh, yeah they they really did pick up immediately after it really yeah yeah uh, and it it added to the song so much more like yeah I got a feeling and dig a pony and like, loads of bits that you just immediately go oh, the, that that those electric keywords just sound so good. But um, I love yeah. that, especially when I got a feeling because I think, uh, I think at one stage Paul is, is kind of describing to Billy what he wants, and straight away he does it, and Paul's like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't need to say anything else." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this complete uh, pro knows his instrument inside. Just, out, just when you, know? you said electric keyboards, Eric, we just talk about the instruments in it. Obviously, we talked about the baritone bass, but like, I love how obviously the Beatles were like cutting edge at the time, so like. 
and also they were setting this place up for the first time so that's why all these new instruments are just getting unboxed in front of them but like you've got like the pedal steel um all the different pianos and keyboards coming in the different guitars george bringing a new guitar in basically every day um but my favorite part is that they brought in the fucking <laughs> prototype piece of shit that Alex is working on. Magic Alex is working on. Yeah. The guitar oh, bass. Yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The rotating fret. Yeah. Like, the, it's the, just the, a piece the, of foam, the, isn't it? Yeah. And, yeah and, it's just a prototype of what <laughs> yeah. he thinks. Like, what a charlatan. And I love when they're in the control room and George or John just picks up like a random, you know, corner off of uh, like a a desk or something he goes oh this is magic alex's uh new prototype of the laser gun <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah taken off the back of a plane yeah <laughs> <laughs> so it has a force field around it <laughs> I, I just love how george completely calls him out like you know george martin like you know oh yeah like and, and, and with the absolute shambles he made uh, the studio. with the studios you know he was in there for months possibly even yeah. a year doing that and he had a fucking clue what he was at awful definitely the world's biggest charlatan a bit, li- bit more background on him. Um, he came from like basically the royal, f- or not royal family, but like a, a political family in uh, Greece. So he had, he was uh, always in money, and he just knew how to network and get in with people. So that's how he got in with the Beatles and kind of the hippie scene and stuff like that. But he just knew how to talk and sell a business and stuff like that. And after the Beatles, I think all the way up to the nineties. He kept saying that he had this uh, reinforced car that was bulletproof. And he had this like patent or like idea that he wouldn't let anyone else see and stuff like that. And everyone believed the shit. And he went and worked for like, it's been a long time since I looked this up. So forgive me if I'm completely wrong. But I think it was like the well, high up politicians in like Morocco or Tunisia or something like that. They actually took him on. And then like they tested the car they got like a lot of soldiers to come in and shoot the crap out of it and it just once again just completely exposed them it was just like what the fuck have we been giving you all this money for but he just knew how to get all this money out of people i think genuinely in his head you think he he thought he could execute these ideas but he just had no actual technical ability at all but what a man like jesus christ like (laughs) He mem- of server was one, like. remember the Beatles were going to buy an island in 1967 they were going to buy yeah. when they were first shooting around ideas for Apple they were going to buy an island off the coast of Greece and it was in the shape of a guitar yeah. but the reason they got in there to negotiations to try buy that island was through Magic Alex and his his dad was very high up in politics he was like a, an associate or an advisor to uh, politicians in Greece but yeah what a fucking chancer complete uh, so I, I loved any mention of him in it it was great <laughs> especially like George on, Martin on the opposite scale of like technology then they also had the they had put together two of the EMI desks to have it be a 16 right, eight track, track. Mm-hmm. 8 track it's, 2 it's 4 two, track, four tracks. Yeah, they're yeah. The, the, the EMI Red it's like R-E-D-D is the name of the mixing console so they had two of those put together I think it's like Red 15 or Red 37 and feeding that into George's borrowed um, 10 grand piece of equipment the tape, tape machine that he had um that was like their their studio, but that was the the cool like other side that they actually had. That was the best technology you could have for recording. And then on the opposite end of the scale, like um, I love how quickly they got it all together. Like that's yeah, like amazing. in John's like all those wires and like that's that's another level of how good he is. Like uh, yeah, and even when they're doing the show on the roof, that they are recording it down in the basement, yeah. like. <laughs> That was, that, was do, that was done on a oh, whim David. like that's yeah. fantastic and to some of those and, uh, are the finished recordings in terms of singles and b-sides and yeah. like one after 909 and um like i'm finding how ian you might know this but i was listening to like the blue album and stuff yeah and get back fades out i think that's taken from the roof yeah that's right yeah and don't let me down i think on the blue album is also taken from the roof yeah it's amazing um, and you know what also actually occurred to me as well uh, how much um, 
some of the rooftop performances, the, the, the one that made onto uh, that made it onto actual Let It Be the album, how much it's spliced. Uh, you know, and then not as in the performance, but you know, like the the banter afterwards and the claps and all that. Oh yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And yo, thanks, Mo. You know, like yeah. that 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 thanks, Mo, is straight after their very first uh, jam of uh, one after nine oh nine. Okay, you know? yeah. Like it's just, I look, it's a stupid little thing, but I, I know it's just like, oh, you know, they they actually, you know, that there there was a bit of. Uh, there's a bit of splicing going on there for let it be like obviously there's a lot more <laughs> when it went on oh, yeah, it's, it's probably the most placed album ever yeah yeah <laughs> in terms of being a like a big big album that's probably one of the most chopped up and manipulated and worked on albums of all time one thing i wanted to talk about mo- moving away from the music and more into the uh, the the how the Beatles day to day functioned. Can we talk a little bit about uh, Mal, their road manager? Mm. Is it Mal Evans? Mal Evans, yeah. Mal Evans, who is basically uh, he's their road manager, but I would call him here their fixer. You yeah. know, what I mean, like Mal, can I get another box of cigarettes? You know, George yeah. Mal, can you go out to the shops and get me a, a tie, a black tie, like cowboys wear? You know, and he just does it. He gets it. But um, there's one bit in it where George has left and they kind of play a little bit. And then the, you can see Ringo's upset and he wants to go to George's house. And he goes up to Mal. He's like, Mal, do you have any pep pills? You know, literally anything they wanted, Mal got, you know? Yeah, well, Mal Evans and um, Derek Taylor were old friends from Liverpool mm. who at basically roadied and stuff so they kind of just found space for their mates and they were constantly there from the very beginning like there was just part of the original crew so yeah i suppose he he found his uh job within the band was to just roadie for them and obviously just help out like mm. you can see him writing lyrics down all the time he's there catching stuff to, so it doesn't fall through the net basically of yeah. cause they are like that's that's amazing for a musician to have someone and it's great that he is their friend rather than yeah. a dog's body that they actually treated him like a human like it's he was one of their friends he genuinely was like they used to they'd hang around with each other and stuff he wasn't just this lad who worked for them so i've always yeah. thought that's a really cool relationship like derek taylor or uh, not derek taylor um derek taylor is I'm not sure if you call him a friend, but Neil Aspinall. Neil Aspinall, Neil is, Aspinall is yeah. one of their mates from Liverpool. I think Derek Taylor I'm a bit wrong about. Um, He's a man. I was actually reading about Mal there uh, a couple of days ago. And good God, what a tragic end. What, what an absolutely tragic end to life. I don't know like, this. And like, um, like um, unbelievable, lads. Like, I, basically, you know, after the Beatles broke up, you know, he did a few more kind of jobs and that around you know the the music industry and that i think he did a bit with harry nilson as well um of course he was friends with george and and john and that um so he could they got him a bit of work there with him but uh he he, he just he got really badly addicted to valium um and uh basically in the mid the mid 70s it was 75 or 76 it was definitely mid 70s anyway um he was completely like really bad at, at one stage and uh, one of his friends called over to assist him and um he had an air rifle uh and uh the friend tried to wrestle it off him but you know mal he was absolutely massive like former He's bouncer big, yeah. you know uh even though he was strung out in volume he, he took the gun off your man and uh he just kind of barricaded himself in in a, in a room you know in an apartment and his friend just didn't know what to bloody do so he he rang the police you know to assist and the police came up and saw that mal had a gun and Mal was pointing the gun at them, you know, and the police at the time didn't know it was just an air rifle. They thought it was an actual proper, you know, rifle. And um, they fired six shots. Uh, four of them went into him and killed him. Actually, yeah, as soon as you mentioned gun, I remembered. That's a fucking like, tragic story. Yeah. Fucking tragic. Mm. But one thing that, sorry, that just, I know it's a very tragic tale, but one very nice thing that I read when... Um, you know when he when he died and all that and when his affairs were trying to be set in order like you know uh his family and that and uh inheritance and all that it was found out that um 
he didn't have a proper uh, pension, uh, you know, out of his work with the Beatles and all that. He, so, so something something went awry anyway. But uh, George Harrison uh, personally went out of his way to uh, put up five thousand uh, pounds to his wife, to Mal's wife. Now five thousand back then would have been you would have been a large large sum of money, mm-hmm. you know. But anyway, look, I know it's it's a very tragic thing to bring up, but yeah. I, uh, yeah, I, I remember. I think I actually looked that up when watching the anthology. Yeah. And wondering why it was just Neil Aspinall talking on it and not Mal. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, I didn't know the part about George. That's pretty cool. George is. Yeah, it's very cool. Now, you know? That, that, I almost feel bad that I brought him up. <laughs> that was <laughs> so tragic, but. Um, Oh no! Yeah, I was, was thinking like, the same thing. I was like, "Hero, though." You know? Yeah, but that's what I'm saying is I can't. That's what I was thinking while I was watching it. Similar to what you just said there, Frank, is I was like, "Oh, I wonder." I'd love to hear the stories from Mal. You know, the things yeah. that he's seen, and mm. you know, um, but yeah. Can we move on to something that uh, is very controversial? I have a, I have an opinion that's very controversial. Okay. I'm looking forward to but this. That you're all going to disagree with, I think. <clears throat> the rooftop gig. I have always, and the main scene it now so documented in uh, Get Back. I don't like it. I don't like the rooftop gig. Well. The one that, the one thing I will say that I don't like about the rooftop gig is that they only play, you know, three or four numbers and they repeat them. You know, yeah, I think it's weak. I just think, like, I'm kind of on Paul's side in terms of I wanted the big gig, not in his ridiculous head of like having it down in fucking north of Africa Primrose Hill. or Primrose Hill or TV special or anything like that, but I would have liked to have seen them play. Albert Hall or you know somewhere or even just on the street or something like that I think just it kind of reaffirms it when they're talking to the fans it's like oh it's the Beatles isn't it but where the fuck are they you know I can't it would have been nice if we could see them and it is just kind of an anti-climax not an anti-climax but it's just like it's not as cool as we all think it is in my head anyway I just always thought it's a bit of a downer after such so it's iconic obviously it's absolutely iconic but as you said it's the repeating the songs over and over again and um yeah like i would have rather like i think what paul wanted this like absolute stop the world the beatles are playing that's it like because you know obviously paul's uh Paul's big tracks and let it be he couldn't play up in the roof you didn't have the piano yeah you know and i mean mine even though it was to be recorded a day or two later, it wasn't fully finished at that point, you know. Um, but like, yeah, as, for me, yeah. I think what would have made it better is if they'd, and obviously this is it's the time and the place and everything, if they'd played some of their old songs, like it would have been like, if oh, they'd, if they'd yeah. really made it a spectacle out of it, like I think it could have been so much cooler. Like it could have been, like I think the people down on the street are going, yeah, the new songs sound nice, but if they'd fucking ripped into a 1969 version of I Want to Hold Your Hand or what I loved that George brought up in Twickenham when they were at the very, very beginning was uh, Every Little Thing. That was class. That yeah. was really, I didn't I didn't know that at all. I was like, when he just starts playing a riff to that, I was like, yeah, George, fucking drive that one home. <laughs> Get a fucking 69 version of that going. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I think I've always just been a bit, I, you know, afraid to, you know, once everybody seems to think something is great, and you're kind of sitting there going, I don't think it's that great. Well, yeah, like <laughs> what really, um, yeah, what annoys me, it probably shouldn't really be called a rooftop gig at all because it wasn't really a gig. You know, I didn't have a proper set list. It was a promo anything. video. It was, it, no, you had, it was a promo yeah. thing because they keep on repeating the tracks because they know it's been filmed. They know it's been recorded by Glenn down yeah. the basement. It's not a gig, you know. No. But I think that's, I think it could have been, uh, that's what I'm saying. I think it's the idea of stop the world the Beatles are playing nearly happened. And people did stop in their tracks and go, what the fuck? This is the Beatles new album. It's just like, you know, this like gorilla attack of music sort of like on the street. And yeah, it could have been so much cooler if they had dragged it out and done it somewhere else that they could be seen or something. I don't know. 
obviously no. given the the circumstances like that they weren't going to get anyone to agree to playing at a venue and the organization of it and george was never going to be involved or invested in that but i just think it could have been done better i don't know no like i i i agree with you in so far as you're saying like this is a controversial point but like i do agree with you it could have been so much better it could have been a gorilla gig and showed up somewhere but like nobody really got to see it there was probably a few lads yeah. on the opposite building on the roof that got to watch the whole thing but the people down on the street were kind of just looking up going oh yeah it sounds good they were kind of perplexed you they know. kind of thought it was speakers yeah yeah they didn't uh, realize and, that the boys and, were actually up there like for the first time it could in have been fucking four years they were actually up yeah. there playing together and you know for the people down on the street it may as well have been sp- speakers playing yeah. it up because the, they're not getting but to i think see it, it would have even been a bit more exciting for them if they had played older song, songs an older yeah. song or so just to be like we are the beatles and we're we're back here you know we're yeah. giving you this little bit of heaven here for a moment but yeah i don't know i just always thought it was a bit of an anticlimax and now seeing mm. how it really played out with how many times they played the songs over i was like mm. and every time i watch it i always get that bit sad going this it's over now isn't it <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, it was just it was just purely a promo thing, you know. Yeah, it was it was like the the paperback writer video or something like that. It was a promo video for that just never properly got finished. But uh, yeah, I think we can start to wrap up here because yeah, we've been say. we've been going at it now for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, oh, but guys, Abbey Road. <laughs> well, let's just go on about Abbey Road here for a second. So Abbey Road, actually, the sessions for Abbey Road, as I mentioned, start on the 22nd of February, which is less than a month after they finished. And um, obviously they went on then to the end of August. The 20th of August was the last yes. time all four of them were in a studio together. And that's when they were finishing up random overdubs for the medley but um yeah a lot of the songs were used on that and it is a bit mad to think how they went from being so loose and back to our roots and four lads at a room five lads at a room with billy um how they wrangled it all together to make this phenomenal studio album so i think it's sometimes we do think from the original 1970s let it let it be film and from get back that we do feel like the Beatles finished. They got down off that roof and they never saw each other again. But um yeah, they went on to make like you hear a lot of the songs you're that got off of Maxwell Silver Hammer, you hear something, you hear I want you she's so heavy. Oh darling, all these they all went on to be that album. So I think what we also need to remember is that like they didn't like kiss make up make an album and agree that they were going to call it a day it's the same if anything the pettiness got even worse during the, the abbey road sessions yeah like, i'm sure there were whole songs that they mightn't have seen each other you know yeah it was a bit more like the white album yeah but i think they were all still there to the end knowing that it was going to be the end um i'm oh, sure george was completely off it then anyway you know doing all yeah. things must pass and uh john working on plastic Ono band you know yeah exactly it was definitely uh they all were filling out a contract almost with finishing abbey road but fucking what a way to go out like um one of the best albums ever made i suppose and now right now as we speak their most popular album um in terms of the digital age is uh, Abbey Road, which I think is quite interesting. But um, yeah, I think the best way to end it, we'll do a room recommends. Insert Ian's tagline here. The Elephant Room recommends. (laughs) And we're back. Um, (laughs) Yeah, just to finish it for, uh, we'll do a get back Room recommends with uh, a song I think that each of us maybe found a new fan love for or never liked before and now do like or a song maybe we've never heard before or something like that. Um, for me, it is the George Har- the Harris songs. Um, 
All Brown Shoe and For You Blue. I loved the idea of putting the newspaper in the piano. I never knew that. Good old George Martin. Uh, yeah, once again, George Martin. How do I make it sound like a broken crap piano? Glenn, how do I do that? And then George just comes in and does it. Um, I never, like, I'd always listened to that. I thought it was like muted guitar strings, but if you listen to it with your headphones, you can clearly can hear the fucking words on the newspaper, nearly like. Yeah. Um, yeah. So all the George Harrison songs, they were so. I've always just kind of not written them off, as I'm saying. They're like, they're songs on Beatles albums that I love and sing along to and stuff when they come on, but they're just, they always they were just there kind of but after watching it i was like and because i think you're on george's side so much through the whole thing that you're like yeah fucking play george's songs there they're really good because you're there going he hasn't finished he just played a finished song for you and you two boys are cobbling together trying to get something um yeah does i mean i mean mine is a fucking masterpiece and uh but i think especially all brown shoe Obviously, that is uh, an Abbey Road outtake when you listen to the actual recording because it has that big, like, mad, noisy guitar solo in it. But, uh, yeah, just Harris songs. As a, just, they're my highlights for it. They're my recommends. Go listen to some George Harrison. Ian? Yeah, um, well, one of my absolute favourites uh, off Let It Be was always I Me mean Mine. Um, and it's fantastic to see uh, the genesis of them, you know, and I mean, mine in particular, the session, like with himself and Ringo working it out, the very early session in Twickenham. And, uh, you know, when uh, John and Yoko are waltzing to it, you know, dancing, like just knowing the, the time uh, signature changes, you know, Ringo is so on yeah. point with that, isn't he? You know, it's unbelievable just when we're on about musicianship, you know. Um, yeah, even, even Ringo's playing on uh, For You Blue. Yeah, just, just takes out the brushes and just it's goes. This just, is a country song, so it needs to be, you know, the country shuffle. Yeah, no, just it's flawless. Just or as uh, George called it, uh, pirate skiffle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did that sound good enough? I was like, it sounds good enough for skiffle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but with the with with the slides, it's the pirate. Pi- it's a, <laughs> John is amazing on that as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, Shane, but. Oh, sorry. No, 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 sorry, finish no, up, no. Finish up, sorry. sorry. <laughs> no, I said, I mean, mine was already an established favour of mine. Uh, now, the, the so I suppose it's more songs rather than song. So kind of use it higher songs. And the ones that I've found, now I already had an appreciation for them anyway, you know, and I know you'll call them granny music, uh, Frank, but, uh, but one thing in particular I really, really took away from the Get Back Sessions because you're actually seeing it evolve and you're seeing John do it, is John's bass playing on the baritone. Yeah. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Like for Let It Be, the song Let It Be itself, it's, 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 it would rival Paul, you know, how he's playing it. You know, he's absolutely on point, you know, the little runs and everything. He's just brilliant on it. Um, and even Let It Be, I actually, or not Let It Be, Long Winding Road, I do actually like it because um, you can see it, that John has an idea of how it should go with the bass and Paul is like, no, 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 no. It should be paired back even more. You should only do absolute bare root notes. Single but John notes, yeah. is like, no, no, I think there should be just a little bit more there. And I tend to agree with what John wanted to do originally. And the cut that we get uh, on Let It Be is a halfway house between what John wanted to do on bass and what Paul wanted. And that's why it sounds half finished, you know, mm. whereas if John was allowed to do what he wanted, like, because you hear it on the early takes and on Get Back, it actually sounds great. I thought I thought it would have you know would have sounded a lot better, especially on the um, the stripped back versions. You know the Glyn Johns uh, recording of it, uh, and even the naked version uh, on Paul McCartney's Naked that was released in the two thousands. If they had have had a, a pristine version of an early Long Winding Road with John's original bass, it would have been great. But anyway, look, we were left with this halfway house. But sorry, just to just to summarize, J- John's bass playing I thought was just brilliant. And uh, just before Shane goes there, next week we will be doing uh, Phil Spector's mixes. We've been a full episode on Phil Spector's uh, ruination of uh, <laughs> the anyway, Shane, what, what would be your uh, 
recommends. So. Well, you've, you've covered everything that I, I was going to say. Like, there, there's not much more for me to say. Like, I was going to say, uh, for, for You Blue is the song that I've listened to the most, um, like, on my commutes to work in the morning after watching it in, in the evening, you know. Um, and... Like, yeah, I, 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 there's not much more for me to say other than that. Like, I really like it makes you from watching it all from its inception to then going and listening to it. It really makes you appreciate it a whole lot more. Um, and yeah, even just like listening to, uh, I got a feeling one thing that I really like, because a lot of the time from a bass player's point of view, a lot of time you, if you look at Beatles songs, the bass for it, it's like so complex and, and interesting. And what I loved about the bass and I got a feeling is literally it's one note held the whole way through with a few little doodle do 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 and then back to the note, you know? Um, so that, like, just that, uh, two of us, has always been one of my favorites and seeing them work that out in, in, in the Scottish series, accents. Scottish accents, you get so many versions, you get a <laughs> slow, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you get this, a slow version, a Scottish ver- version, you have a true your teeth version, like a, almost like a ventriloquist version. John was um, brilliant at that. Paul kind of, you could see his mouth moving, mm. but John was brilliant. <laughs> Um, Can do we they do just say to, was anyone else a bit disappointed that they rushed through the last few days? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why didn't they just give us an extra fucking half hour of them? They, sh- they should, they should have cut down and tweaked them more. That, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a bit strange. I thought that they just like made a montage while the credits went on about that. Because there would have been class stuff going on there, you know. Yeah, because they, they were really on point at that. And the stage. cameras were definitely running for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll tell, tell you Frank we'll get a director's cut hopefully <laughs> uh, extra I'll, hours I'll, I'll leave it on this for, for me for recommenders it's like if you haven't when we've completely ruined it and you don't need to watch it <laughs> but just, it, just, watch, just watch it um, like I there's so many moments in it that I loved of like George coming in when he's talking about I Me Mine and he says I, I wrote this last night because I did you see what was on telly last night and I got that idea from the waltz from like the Russian ballroom dancing yeah, and talk about the sci-fi movie and stuff, a sci- sci- yeah sci-fi yeah. movie followed by russian waltzing and he was like yeah i've got an idea for a song and um because oh, i wanted to say it earlier there's a bit in it where they're all tuning it's when um billy's arrived and they're tuning they're getting him to play and they're tuning off of his keyboard and Paul's just sitting there not tuning but they they all and Paul's like oh come on now John tune up and all this kind of stuff and they play for a bit and then George comes in and they're like well George Martin well, what you, well, they wouldn't say George Martin but they're like well what did you think of that and he's like uh, yeah it's pretty good but the, the bass is out of tune and all of them they jump just out of their seats yeah. they're like, oh, like a bunch of lads Wee, yeah it's yeah. out of tune Paul <laughs> just like yeah just but yeah that's what just all, it's for all of those little bits and the humor and everything like that it's just so great um so yeah just watch just watch it and then yeah i'm gonna watch it again like and i won't be bored <laughs> definitely definitely yeah. we're getting to a point now where this podcast might be as long as the series <laughs> so we'll, uh... this definitely doesn't have the re the re-listenability of <laughs> the re-watchability <laughs> of let it be but uh, yeah i think i'll just finish it with uh, us kind of say we just did this because we're fans once again people get onto us if i talk about the beatles so we'll just get this out of our system <laughs> it's probably in no way interesting we are literally just doing this for the crack i'm not even gonna fucking edit this i'm just gonna lob it up and absolutely let uh yeah. people listen to our opinions on it because we are we're very big fans mm. and uh yeah We'll be back with a Christmas episode. We'll do some promo for what's coming up. We're going to do a Christmas episode because we did one last year. Um, I'm already going to start out and say it's not going to be as good as the one last year because how much can you say about Christmas, (laughs) really? But it'll still be good, so listen. Or maybe go and listen to last year's one because last year's one was really good. Uh, But (laughs) maybe maybe it'll be better. Maybe. Who knows? It depends what you're into. Probably won't. Uh, I'm going (laughs) to... drop some knowledge about stuff that's kind of vaguely related to christmas so if you if you don't really like christmas listen to our next week's christmas episode 
And uh, if anyone wants to send us Christmas presents, please do. Because it's nice to get them. And uh, <laughs> I was just trying to scrounge things up. <laughs> it it's so sad. <laughs> please. Please yes, give, no, I'm just give, trying to, I just had to get free shit off people here. Come give on. kindly to the poor boy. Give kindly. <laughs> Frank wants Frank wants a baby Yoda if that's what he wrote to Santa yeah. for. So I want a baby Yoda and I want let it be a vinyl. I want the uh, the pre order of the, the Blu rays of uh, the series. And a, oh, and, wait, and a subscription to Disney Plus so I don't have to watch it illegally. I'm just going to drop that in, Disney. I did not pay any money for those eight hours I watched. <laughs> I wanted to ask... quality was still good, Frank. It was fantastic. Uh, it was brilliant. Streamers really know what they're doing nowadays. <laughs> I wanted to ask you guys this quick question because you know when Disney got Star Wars that people got excited because they were like, oh, Princess Leia is now officially a Disney princess. So is Yoko Ono a Disney princess now? that this is on Disney. I would say Paul is much more of a princess <laughs> from that first episode. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, that's one thing we didn't mention is it does very much so certify because I never bought into this that Yoko broke the band up. She sat there and did fuck all. Oh, completely, she yeah. did not break the band up. I, w- I love when Paul at the very end of the third episode actually says something like he... He like loses the run of himself and says, "Oh, we're gonna need to find out that Yoko, aren't we?" And then she gives him no reaction back, and he's kind of like, "Oh shit, I shouldn't have said anything to her. She doesn't like me." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you see actually? Um, both Yoko and Linda actually did. They, they got yeah, they a good were, few conversations. They were having like, the chats. You know. Yeah, yeah, it was nice to see that. It was probably just niceties, but uh, yeah, but still, you know, yeah. it was just weird. Kind of saying Linda, uh, in general. We yeah. don't really see much of her uh, ever in footage from that era. We always see Yoko. Yeah, it was weird to see her there. Maureen, actually, this is what I want to say. Maureen looks like grey crack. <laughs> yeah. Just out of all yeah. the wives that popped by, Maureen looks like yeah, you know, she looks like a keeper. Even though Ringo didn't, but keeper. But um, she was definitely up for the crack, all right. Oh, she was Re- like, really getting into it. Yeah, back in the control room, just fucking rocking out to get. Yeah, back. that's right. <laughs> it's like she's just no her herself and Ringo must have been great crack to hang around with. All the others are too moody. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we we'll leave it there. Maureen Starkey, <laughs> a legend, a highlight for me. <laughs> we leave it there, guys. Yeah. Okay. Let it be. Bye. <laughs>